Welcome to another edition of the Giant Subtle Podcast. It's all brought to you by PSENG, energy efficiency for game time and any time. Visit PSEG.com slash Giants for discounts, rebates, and home energy assessments. And in this week's Giants Huddle is someone that lives and breathes football as much as pretty much anyone on this planet. He is Mike Mayock. Uh, for the oldies out there, Giants defensive back in 82-83. Now he covers the league for Westwood One Sports, also, of course, former general manager. Uh, for the Raiders, Mike, it's good to see you, man. We saw you up in Minnesota for the game on Sunday. It was good to good to catch up for a few minutes at halftime. How you doing? I'm doing great. I, I thought um, having an opportunity to do that Giants game for me was awesome. And not just because I was a Giant. Uh, to be honest with you, I think Brian Dayball is the coach of the year. I think what he and Joe Shane have done is amazing. And I couldn't wait to see them in person because I spent a day at your training camp. And, you know, you go all the way back to the beginning, right? You, you, you check out training camp and you're coming off four wins. And to watch what Joe and Brian did, uh, I thought the coaching staff did an amazing job. And it was really awesome to see it in person last weekend. Yeah. What was your major takeaway seeing them in person? My major takeaway was I was down on the field before the game and we had Daniel Jones in the senior bowl in 2019 when, when I was in my first year with the Raiders and uh, I really liked him. I loved his intensity, his football IQ, intelligence, work ethic. Uh, he looked like he got bigger to me. I mean, he looks closer to Josh Allen right now at like six, five two. you know, I don't know what he's weighing in at, but he's a bigger, stronger version of what I remember athletic as can be uh i really thought that his legs were the difference in the game yeah and he had to bulk up too given with it weighed him what 17 times i think in the cave on sunday something like that and much like with brian dable and josh allen up in buffalo you know his legs is now so much of what the giants do not just in the design stuff he was much more effective as a scrambler picked up so many key uh, first down conversions yeah, especially in the first half. Uh, he ran the ball 10 times for 70-some yards in the first half. It's funny because when we do the, the Westwood one games, I have to do a keys before the game. And my two keys for the Giants offense were you, you had to convert uh, red zone opportunities into touchdowns, which you did, and you did all year, by the way. And number two, Daniel Jones had to use his legs all day long. And, and I really, really thought that was the difference in the football game. I, I thought he did a phenomenal job. Uh, both impromptu, which is what you're talking about, the scrambles in the first half. And and I thought they did a great job with them also just on the planned quarterback runs to complement Saquon Barkley. Yeah, no question about it. And I guess we'll get to it now. I'll circle back to the game. Any doubt in your mind that Daniel Jones is the next Giants quarterback for quite a long time if, after this season at, at some point with a long-term extension? I would hope not. I, I would think that um, – from the Giants' perspective, you certainly want him back. And I would think from Daniel's perspective, um, he had by far his best year. Um, and I would assume that he'd love to be part of what's going on. And I think reasonable minds can get to an agreement in the offseason. No question about it. All right, Mike, let's stick with the offense then. Is this pass-heavy approach, you think, something that's going to continue? Or is this something that you think was more, all right, we know the Vikings' pass defense has been pretty much a sieve all year, and they don't defend the middle of the field well. They kill them with crossers. Or do you think they found something here? Do you think they're going to go back to maybe more of a balanced-looking attack next week against Philly? Um, I, I think Brian and Kafka, I think they're smart enough to understand that every week changes. And, and obviously, I love Brian's approach because it's basically, look, we got to get a little bit better every day. We got to grind. We we And and that's what they've done. And uh, they haven't put undue pressure on themselves. Um, I think as far as run pass, it, it, it's a, I lo see, if you look at the Eagles for a second, what they've done with Jalen Hurts in the run pass game is very similar, okay? All year long, Jalen Hurts has been so effective because not just the RPO game, but because they have planned quarterback runs, just like the Giants utilized, uh, especially last weekend. Plus, he can impromptu scramble. So I really think that the Giants will take advantage of whatever they think the Eagles are giving them this weekend. It, it, and it can't just be one or the other. 
you know, Mike, and we've seen, I think, in the last three weeks where the Giants have played their starters, not including that last game against Philly, you know, they've passed the ball as well as they have all year. The Christmas Eve game against Minnesota, the game against the Colts, and then this playoff game. What have they found in, in your eye watching the tape in the passing game that's allowed them to be so much more effective the last three weeks than they were for really the first three and a half months of the year? I think it's a couple things. Number one, I think it's uh, trust and confidence. And, you know, those the, the Giants wideouts have been beaten up by media people all year long. And to be honest with you, I get a huge kick out of watching their tape because, you know, I'm a, I'm a former 10th round pick. I'm a guy that always felt like he had to work harder than other people. Um, and I think and that gives you a little bit of an attitude. It gives you a little bit of chip on your shoulder. And I see that with all your wideouts. I mean, Hodgins, you know, what they got him what in November when when Buffalo waved him, you know, you know, he was, uh, you know, Slayton was a fifth round pick. I think Hodgins was a sixth round pick. Uh, Richie James, I think, was a seventh round pick. Um, so they, have, I think Daniel Jones trusts those guys. And I think they're accountable. They're tough. They're where they belong. I think their offensive line's given Daniel Jones some time. I, sp- I think with the run game getting better, and you look at Saquon's numbers, you know, he, they, they didn't have to rush him as many times. But he got enough touches that his the yardage he gained in the run and pass game was signif- significantly over 100 yards. So I, I think really the balance is what's helped the pass game. Okay, and I think the receivers are accountable. Um, I just I think the Giants have maximized everything they do on offense. All right, let's jump over to the defensive side of the ball, Mike. And you know I knew you had a good game watching it live when I rewatched the game uh, yesterday morning. Boy, Dexter Lawrence was a monster in that game. And frankly, the Giants might lose by a touchdown if he doesn't have those key pressures that he has on some of those Vikings third downs and other dropbacks because guys were open. But, you know, Lawrence was in Cousins' face the whole game. And he, you know, with with Cousins' lack of mobility, you got that rush up the middle. I really feel like Lawrence was the difference. And by the way, Leonard Williams did a good job in there too. But I thought Lawrence especially did just an unbelievable job. And he has all year of getting pressure up the middle. 97 is a beast. Okay. And it doesn't matter what tape you put on and uh, 350 pounds. He moves like a guy, a hundred pounds less, which, which means to me, he's a freak. Okay. He is a physical freak. Uh, he can dominate against the run game, but I remember for years talking to quality quarterbacks, whether it was the Mannings or, or, you know, just whoever you want to Matt Ryan, um, whoever you want to talk to, what bothers a quarterback the most? And they'll all tell you it's immediate pressure up the middle. Okay? you If you have two edge guys screaming off the edge, you know, if Thibodeau and Ojolari are coming up off the edge and you've got no pressure up the middle, quarterback's just going to step up into the pocket. You know, Tom Brady made a living. Matt Ryan, Eli, Peyton, they make a living stepping up in the pocket. When 97's in there, you can't do that. And, you know, you could count how many times Kirk Cousins had here and then his hands and eyes come down. And as soon as his hands and eyes come down, it's all over. You win. Yeah, he could have had K.J. Osborne on a crosser. It was either on the fourth down or third down play at the end of the game. But Lawrence was there and he couldn't, you know, turn his shoulders to make the throw. Um, You know, Wing Martindale, when he got here, Mike... We all knew him as a big blitzer in Baltimore, right? We saw, you know, he lost all his corners last year, and the Bengals killed him in that game late with the six touchdowns, Burrow over the top all game. And while his blitz rate has remained high this year, I was very impressed with the way he has varied what he's done in certain matchups. And I thought this Viking game was a perfect example, right? We saw a ton of quarters coverage, which is not what Wink likes to do. A lot of bracketing of Justin Jefferson. You know, they kept everything in front. And I just thought it showed a lot of flexibility from him to customize the game plan against the offense and the opponent. And frankly, going away to what's really in his DNA, which is to send extra pressure and play man. I agree with all that. And I've known Wink for 20 years. And I've always felt like he almost can't help himself. You know, he's going to heat up a quarterback. When in doubt, he's going, right? Um, I think, I'm trying to, I think it was the Dallas game. Um, he brought a ton of pressure and, and Giants got beat. Uh, I think it was a tight end route in the end zone. Um, and I, I kind of felt like watching that tape that that was a little bit too much, put too much pressure on, on a coverage there. Um, and the last several weeks, I think he's been a little bit more judicious 
with it. And I think Dexter Lawrence wrecking things inside. I think getting Ojolari back healthy, um, you know, along with Thibodeau has helped. Um, I give him a lot of credit. They took Jefferson out of the game in the second half. Uh, and uh, a lot of bracket, a lot of double team, no matter whether he was lined up outside or inside, you're taking – uh, literally one of the three or four best offensive players in the NFL out of the game in the second half. Um, and I think that was a big part of it. And I give Wink a ton of credit. Wink is such a smart football guy and such a good coach. Um, and I, I think he played exactly to what needed to happen to beat the Minnesota Vikings last Sunday. You know, Mike, I know you love talking about young players and evaluating them. What do you think about this Giants rookie class? They've played a really big part in their success this year. Evan Neal's had his issues. A lot of young offensive linemen do. You know, Kayvon Thibodeau's made some big plays. Daniel Bellinger has basically been the starting tight end all year. Your thoughts on these Giants rookies? Unfortunately, they've had a bunch of injuries with, you know, uh, some of the other guys. Cordell Flott had the big PBU at the end of the game, too. Flott got in, yep. Yep. So yep. I guess your thoughts on on how big of a part of the future you think this rookie class is going to be and, and and how good can these guys be down the road? You know, ultimately, I think they're going to be really good. Um, you start with Thibodeau, the, the number five overall pick, and some people in the media have criticized the lack of, quote, sack production. I don't see that. I On tape, what I see is a guy got a ton of quarterback pressures and is going to be a star in this league. Um, Evan Neal is a talented, physical traits, big, long He's going to be a starting tackle in the league forever, um, but he played like a rookie a lot, and that's okay. Offensive line's hard, man. They, people don't understand how hard it is to come into the league, and, and you're you're trying to block all these freaks one on one. And um, you know he got hurt a little bit, um, so he struggled. I thought at different times this year. However, they kept playing him, and he's getting better, and he'll be really good. Uh, Flat. He can run. He, he, he can make some plays. Bellinger, um, you know, he had a key third down conversion the other day. I like Bellinger. Um, Wandale Robinson got hurt, right? And, I mean, there's a guy that, that I think is going to ultimately be a really good football player. Um, and then you had the, the offensive lineman that got hurt early, you know, the North Carolina kid. With, uh, as yeah, they actually had two of them that got hurt. Um, Zudu and, and then um, McKeithen was the bigger guy. Yeah, yeah. McKeithen and Azudo. Um, so they had a lot of their rookies hurt, but they still got good production out of their primary guys. And by the way, Darian Beavers might've been the starting Mike linebacker. If he didn't tear his ACL within a camp, either the linebacker out of Cincinnati. So, and by yeah. the way, you mentioned Thibodeau as a pass rusher. I thought his play on that screen in the fourth quarter was also emblematic. You know, everyone thought of him as just a pass rusher coming out. He's done a good job in the run and some of the non pass rushing things they've asked him to do. Yeah. The play you're talking about. Even live, I saw it happen. You know, he's rushing the quarterback. They throw the screen, sticks his foot in the ground, and goes and chases him down. Um, that kind of hustle, so impressive. Now, yeah. does he have to get better against the run? Yeah, he does. Um, and I think he has. I don't think it – you know, people don't understand. When you're a pass, quote, pass rushing defensive end coming out of Oregon or anywhere, and you're 250, 254 pounds, whatever you are, and you're trying to, 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 to set an edge – against 320 pound tackles, that's not easy. And there's a lot of technique and repetition necessary to get good at it. And I thought he, as long as you're tough and you're willing to work at it, he'll be fine. And I think he is. Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's look at this matchup against the Eagles real quick here, Mike, before we say goodbye. Again, we appreciate the time. You know, Jalen Hurts, to me, he's such a key to everything the Eagles do. Everyone talks about Devontae Smith and A.J. Brown, and we'll touch on them too. But their offensive line is probably the best in football. And what makes, I think, the Miles Sanders part of the run game go in a lot of ways is the threat of the Hurts run. And I think how healthy he is and whether or not he can be a runner in this game and not a guy that, you know, runs for four yards and slides, but like a real, like they run power with him, right? And that to me is so key to how this Eagles offense can function. If that's there, I mean, they're tough to stop. If it's not, I think it's a whole new ball game. Yeah, I, I mean, here's the deal. I, I mentioned that I thought your head coach was was the coach of the year. I think the executive of the year is Howie Roseman. Absolutely. And they're gifted everywhere. Okay. They are really physically talented and gifted. And I don't think anybody in either building would deny that there's more talent today in the Philadelphia building than in the Giants building. Okay. So you start with that premise. 
On offense for the Eagles, their offensive line is a top three offensive line in the league by any metric. Their wideout group is a top five by any metric. Okay. They're running back. Miles Sanders is a really good football player when healthy. And to your point, because of the quarterback, kind of like Daniel Jones and Saquon, right? To your point, when the quarter there's a threat of quarterback run, it's going to help the other running back. Okay. They're tight end, got it when he's healthy. So there aren't any soft spots to exploit for, for anybody's defense when you're going up against the Philadelphia offense. But again, to your point, when you have a healthy quarterback in Jalen Hurts, he's a different guy. It's just like the Giants last week. It's planned quarterback run. It's RPO. It's spontaneous play when the quarterback's in trouble in, in the pocket and can scramble. So if Jalen Hurts is healthy and, and it's the normal game plan, all bets are off. They're they're flying on all cylinders. If if they're trying to protect them like they did in their last game, it's a different conversation. Yeah, I think it really is. What do you think Wink's approach is going to be here? Does he have two plans based on what he sees from Hertz early and then determine how much of a threat he is as a runner? And then you would just, Mike, how do you think as a coach, you kind of head into this game, not exactly knowing what that quarterback's going to be able to do? I think it's one comprehensive plan that you can adjust as the game goes on based on whatever happens. And, and again, um, if, if the Eagles aren't running their planned quarterback runs in the first half, it'll give you an indication of what the health of the quarterback is. If if you're seeing quarterback power and you're seeing quarterback counter and quarterback sweep and quarterback draw, it, it means they feel like this kid's really healthy and, and good to go. If they're just trying to rely more on, on the run game, the traditional run game, it's a different conversation. But I think for the Eagles, it's really good – that they got a chance to dust Jalen Hurts off a little bit in week 18, just to give him a chance to get back into it, get reacclimated. So the first time he does, does it, it's not in the divisional playoffs. How much do you take out of that matchup if you're either team? The Giants didn't play their starters. It was kind of a weird game. The Eagles knew they weren't starting. And, you know, that can affect how, how players kind of approach it sometimes, right? So how much do you take from that game matchup? Is the Giants kind of hung with them, even though the backups were in? And then, you know, a month earlier when the Eagles really took it to the Giants, I thought the two teams are very different then than they are now. But how much can you really take out of those two matchups when you're thinking about this game? I don't take much out of it, in all in all honesty. Um, division foes, they know each other. You know, third time this year. There are not a lot of secrets. Um, the health of Lane Johnson is another conversation. You know, that to me, that's a significant conversation. Um, so I, I don't put a whole lot into week 18 other than it just reinforced to me how well the Giants are coached, how tough they are, and how hard they compete, regardless of what the circumstances are. A couple more from Mike Mayock here. He is the call of Bills and Bengals this week. It's on WFN here in New York at 3 p.m. Make sure you check it out. He called Giants and Vikings over the weekend. Do you think Wink can approach the Eagles' weapons outside similarly to how he did Jefferson? Or is the fact that they got Brown and Smith and, frankly, a team that's much more willing and has the the want to run the ball in Minnesota? In Minnesota, they, they run it, but they don't really want to run it. They want to throw it. Can he have that approach? Or is he going to have to maybe bring one of those safeties a little bit closer to the box to account for that run game? I, I think the hard part is that with Cousins, you had a, a quarterback that you knew where to find him. He's in the pocket. He's not necessarily a run, threat to run. You can play two-man against him. You can do some different things where you, you know he's probably not going to tuck it and go, right? So from a game plan perspective, you start with that. It's a lot, You know where the quarterback's going to be. It's easier to find him. The hard – and also, I mean – you knew you were going to give something up a little bit last week with the amount of attention put on Justin Jefferson. What you gave up was the tight end. Yep. Hawkinson had a big game in week 16. He had a big game last Sunday and you knew you were going to, that was going to happen if you were going to put double team 18 so often. So the problem with the Eagles is not only that the quarterback can tuck it and run any play in the game, but it's also that, you know, they, they got, literally three wide outs that can beat you. Like people don't even know who Quez Watkins is. He's good. Quez, he's got a, he got jets. He flies. Okay. So if you get him on any kind of crossing route, 
he's going to run away from people. You get him on a vertical, he's going to run away from people. And all anybody talks about is, is 11 and, and Devontae Smith. Um, but they got three wide outs that can beat you. They got a tight end that can beat you. You know, so it's hard to, to say I'm going to take. So I think what you'll see Wink doing is on different downs and distances, especially on third down. Who does he want to take out? You can't take everybody out. You're trying to take 11 out because he, you think he might be running a slant. You're trying to take Devontae Smith out because you think it's going to be, be some kind of deep in route. Um, I think he's going to have to pick and choose who he wants to eliminate. So, Mike, the Eagles finished with 70 sacks this year. First of all, let that settle in how crazy that number is. 70 sacks is ridiculous. Plus, they have two really good cover corners. How do you attack that if you're the Giants offense, knowing you, know, you have an offensive line that's been better, but it still isn't you know, like a Philadelphia Eagle top three unit? And your wide receivers, while like they're feisty, they're good, they get open, they, they, they play hard, you know, they're going to struggle to run away from maybe these corners. How do you approach that if you're Brian Dable, Mike Kafka, in trying to run your offense against the Eagles on, on Saturday night? I, I think it's similar to last week, in all honesty. I think I think Daniel Jones is the key to the whole thing, and I think you got to be able to run the ball efficiently with him, okay? Um, I don't know if you're going to run it 17 times again or not, but if Daniel Jones is not able to uh, either scramble effectively – or in the planned quarterback run game, efficiently gain up, gain four, five, six yards every time he does that, I think the Giants are going to struggle. Okay? So I think Daniel Jones' legs are really important again this week. Um, I also think, again, I, I think offensively, the Giants have done a great job situationally getting guys open. And, you know, it. it I, I just – there, there's no, how do I put this? There, there's no uh, magic potion. The Eagles have better players. Okay, they do. And and the Giants know it, and the Eagles know it. But there are ways to scheme guys open. And and, there, and it, to me, it, you can't just keep being in third and nine all day long. Okay, you got to gain yardage on first down. Daniel Jones has to take pressure off the, the offense with his legs. If if they stifle J Daniel Jones with his legs, I think it's going to be a tough day for the Giants. Fair enough, Mike. Uh, two more real quick. Big picture. Uh, how do you see the the larger playoff pictures in both conferences right now? I think the NFC is pretty open. Dallas, I thought, made a pretty good statement on Monday night against Tampa. More talented team, but they, you know, they played well after having a bad last game of the year. I think that game against San Francisco is going to be fun. And then, boy, the game you have, I mean, that's going to be fantastic. Josh Allen and Joe Burrow. I think we're going to have a fun few weeks here in the NFL playoffs. I don't think there's any doubt. I mean, um, in the NFC, from a talent perspective, I think Philadelphia and San Francisco have the most talent. Um, I think Dallas, you know, you don't trust Dallas because they're, they're not consistent. But, you know, they turned it on against Tampa Bay. And I think the Giants are just a pain in the butt. They're so well coached, so tough. Um, is this the Giants year? I don't know. You know, I, I think the Giants have to get better uh, over time, but the Giants can beat anybody just because of the way they play and how they're coached and their quarterback. So um, in the NFC, it's really intriguing. And I think in the AFC, you know, Kansas City, Cincinnati, Buffalo, I mean, all three of those teams can win a Super Bowl in my opinion. Now, Cincinnati's challenge, and I just spent three hours watching their tape this morning on offense, um, their offensive line's beat up. They're, they're, they've got three starters that were out in the second half the other day. And trying to call plays with three of your five starters out of the offensive line is a hard thing, especially in a playoff game. So I think the health of the offensive line is critical to Cincinnati, but you know, I think the, the five Super Bowl, I mean, the, the three AFC teams, I think, can win a Super Bowl. And I think the two NFC teams, uh, Philly and San Francisco, can win a Super Bowl. All right, Mike. Finally, uh, I'll be interviewing Eric Galco, who runs the Shrine Bowl, in about 30 minutes. I was watching some of the Shrine guys as I was getting ready to do this interview with you to prepare for that interview. Are we going to see some Mike Mayock draft evaluation at some point this spring before the draft? I doubt it. I've spent I've spent most of my time watching NFL tape this year because of uh, what I'm doing with Westwood One Radio. So uh, I, I I think yeah, I doubt it. Just short answer. 
Fair enough. Mike, it was a pleasure talking to you, man. You do a great job. Thank you so much for the time. You're very generous with it. And we'll talk to you real soon, all right? Thank you, John. Good luck this week. Mike Mayock and the Giants Auto Podcast brought to you by PSEG Energy Efficiency for game time at any time. Visit PSEG.com slash Giants for discounts, rebates, and home energy assessments. For Mike Mayock, I'm John Schmelk. We'll see you next time on the Giants Auto Podcast.